the opposition says a non-confidence vote is imminent. Tensions build up as Manam Resettlement Bill goes before Parliament and another nasty accident along the freeway. This is National MTV News with Tokana Hasavi. Good evening and welcome to Wednesday's News. It's good to have your company again. The opposition has filed a motion on the vote of no confidence. It is now before the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Aide Ganassi, and the Parliamentary Committee to deliberate on. It is expected to be announced on the floor of Parliament next week. MTV's Mickey Cavera reports. The opposition still remains committed to its plans for a vote of no confidence. Opposition leader Don Polier announced that the motion on the vote of no confidence was compiled and presented to Deputy Speaker Aide Ganassi. He says the Deputy Speaker has accepted the motion for deliberation. Uh, it is compiled and presented in accordance uh, with the laws, with the standing orders. Uh, every requirement is met. And we have done it carefully, we have taken time, we have studied the issues, we have looked at the laws, and we have followed the process in presenting this motion. While withholding specific details, Polier revealed that the members of the government have also signed the motion. The motion outlines reasons behind the opposition's move to give a clear understanding to the deliberating committee. We have articulated every proof and evidence, material evidence we have. Other members of the opposition have also thrown their support for the motion. Vanimo Green MP Belden Nama maintains the reasons captured in the motion calls for a change in the government. All the reasons that are captured in our submission that the opposition leader has presented with the deputy opposition leader to the acting speaker of the national parliament gives no excuse to any member of parliament who represent 8 million people of this country to remove the prime minister. The government yesterday proved their numerical strength on the floor of parliament. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill also brushed aside a vote of no confidence. I, I think you can say that the government has uh, got numbers close to 100 you know, people already, but PNC itself has got uh, 61 members. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, we are always uh, willing to work with all our coalition partners. All our coalition, coalition partners remain intact. The opposition expects the motion to be announced on the floor of parliament in the coming weeks. The announcement will begin the process of the vote of no confidence. Mickey Cavera, National MTV News. Well, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has described the opposition's motion for a vote of no confidence as desperate and ambitious and not done in the best interest of the nation but for personal interest driven by a desire for revenge. He says the country today faces huge challenges with El Nino and global economic conditions which require Parliament's attention. He said the 2016 budget will be presented next week and we should focus on that and not Somaria and Polia's ambition to return to government. He called on the country to compare what the current administration had achieved in the last three years as opposed to what the previous government had done from 2002 to 2011. Well, the El Nino situation in the country was a point of focus during question time in Parliament this morning. Northern Province Governor Gary Jufa questioned Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Intergovernment Relations Leo Dion on the role of his ministry in developing relief supplies to the provinces. In response, Mr Dion said due to lack of funding of the National Disaster Office, the government is looking at disseminating some of the powers to the provinces and the district administrations. Governor Dufa asked the Deputy Prime Minister to explain his ministry's strategy in delivering relief supplies to drought-affected areas. What is the role of the ministry that you are in charge of insofar as its strategy for the delivery of relief to all provinces? Mr. Dion said Governor Jufa's question would also be best answered by respective provincial governments and district administrations. 
He said the disaster office has not received funds for many years and the government was looking at improving the office's operations and its administration as well as decentralizing some of the powers to the provinces and to district administrations. Delegation Blong. National disaster and we go down Penis Longol provincial government. Now provincial government must take ownership. Finance Minister James Marape said when government framed the 2015 budget, no one anticipated a disaster of this magnitude. The allocation of 25 million kina for disaster was used for the first situation in the Highlands region and ongoing efforts. He said government saw DSIP as the closest allocation in budget to the people and has allowed the use of up to 2 million kina from DSIP to assist those affected. And so yes, I confirm that we have agreed to for the use and have issued, issued financial instruments, financial instruction to ensure that up to 2 million kina of all DSIP uh, to be used for disaster relief and drought relief programs nationwide. The government is expected to make a statement tomorrow with details on how it will address the disaster issues, especially the current drought situation. The finance minister also announced an increased funding allocation for disaster in the 2016 national budget. Uh, we are responsible enough knowing that our people are suffering. When the treasurer hands down the budget next week, you will see that a substantial amount of fund is parked for disaster programs. And an increase in allocation will be evident in the next budget to be delivered. That is how we are responding. Deli Waigeno, National MTV News. Well, Mendy Munhiu MP Dei Kewanu says the 2016 budget must include disaster as a priority. The Mendy MP said the current El Nino experience is a lesson for all stakeholders to plan for the future. MTV's Jack Labave Jr. with this report. Natural disasters are unpredictable, but their impact attracts serious attention from all stakeholders. The current El Nino experienced in the country called for quick funding response from the government. Mendy MP De Kewanu says this system must be a priority in the 2016 budget. Well, the National Government committing the 2016 budget in terms of a disaster as a focus, and then uh, we should be able to overcome this. Mendy Muni District sacrificed some of its 2015 DSIP funds to cater for the district after frost severely affected nearly all its allergies. Last week, Finance Minister James Marape called on districts to use some of the DSIP funds to help alleviate disaster issues. Cabinet has made this decision already for us to allow for uh, DSIP and PSIP funds to be used to address the disaster uh, problems we have in the country. So. The Mendy MP says budgeting for disaster is now critical for the district, national government, provincial government and the private sector. Uh, well, I've already committed 450,000 from the district. So I will commit another 1.5 million, 1,550,000 uh, uh, additional uh, to actually commit to disaster. The Mendy Munu District Authority is expected to roll out final relief supplies to the Live Valley LLG this week once logistics are confirmed. Jack Lapave, Jr., National MTV News. In a news broadcast in August this year, MTV News aired a story regarding funding of the 40th Independence Celebrations, which had received viral interest on social media. Now, MTV reported National Events Minister Justin Chichenko denying allegations that were made on social media blogs. In that story, reference was made to the social media blog site on which these allegations were published. The station apologizes for any hurt and damage caused by the aired images in the news story to Prime Minister Peter O'Neill and Lady Nee Cragnellini and unreservedly retracts any unintentional implications of collusion between the two parties. Well, National MTV News continues after these short messages. Stay with us for more local stories.
Welcome back to National MTV News. The Supreme Court today dismissed an application by Attorney General Anopala to restrain police from arresting him. Justice George Manuhu pointed out that the power of police to investigate or arrest should not be interfered with and that criminal matters do not recognize the status of a person in a community. Pala was charged with conspiring with others to defeat the course of justice in relation to the case involving the Paul Paraka lawyer's legal bills payments. Well, members of the Morabian, Morabian Executive Council have joined Deputy Opposition Leader Sam Basil and Morabe Governor Kelly Naru calling for changes in the national government. The Morabe leaders want fair distribution of national government funds for provinces and districts the introduction of the Independence Commission Against Corruption, or ICAC, and the reinstatement of the task force sweep. MTV's Bethany Harriman reports. The Morobe branch of government continues to foster a strong stance with Deputy Opposition Leader Sam Basil and the Morobe Governor Kelly Naru. The working relationship continues to reach new heights. The members of the Provincial Executive Council, led by Deputy Governor Judith Nalau, called for a series of changes in the national government to suit Morobe's needs. So, I appeal all uh, open MPs, uh, please me ask me, some time. We, we really need uh, stability in the country, and at least people can look at sign on Morobe. So, I ask him, please, all must. Uh, party politics. Now come down. Me play Tintin no more. And then governor needs to know that we have done more for lay from this government than any other government in the past. What we need today from governors is that we need to have a very constructive partnership. Morobe Governor Kelly Naru wants task force sweep back. He says if the government is serious about fighting corruption, it must bring them back. Only then will we know that the government is serious about fighting corruption. Otherwise, talk talk yeah, talk talk nothing to solve. No one can keep until I talk talk. Was until a PSI people me plan a DSIP yeah. Me plan we go talk talk iko. Government is kidnapping and breaking na talk. Yeah, kasi ka you kusin forty five million yeah. Member you kusin fifteen million yeah. We have given him uh, hundred and uh, hundred and thirty five million kina uh, uh, in the these three years, two thousand and thirteen, two thousand fourteen, two thousand fifteen. 135 million kina PSIP. We want to know is where is that money gone? We want to know is which project. I'm waiting for an invitation to witness his opening of one of his projects. The Morbe provincial government challenges the prime minister and state ministers to introduce the independent commission against corruption or ICAC. ICAC law is very tough. It's tougher than ombudsman commission. The proceeds of crimes act that will go and rip off everything that somebody owns, they will come and liquidate it and put the money back into the PNG's coffers. ICAC law is still to be implemented, I mean, passed on the floor of parliament. The Morbe provincial branch of government continues to speak out about the changes it feels that the national government needs to make. It also speaks of a Morbe block geared towards the interest of the Morbe people. But while it speaks of that, most of the members of parliament from Morbe continue to remain loyal to the People's National Congress-led government and Prime Minister Peter O'Neill. Bethany Harriman, National MTV News, Lay. Well, two men are injured with knife and spear wounds while 18 houses were burnt to the ground after a clash at Boundary Road on Saturday. The fight began two weeks ago between Mount Crest Community at Boundary Road and relatives of a suspect whom the community accused of using a bush knife to take 150 kina in cash and six bottles of beer from a man at Mount Crest. The community have handed over names of the 17 suspects to police for investigation. The PNG aggregate company lost one of its cement mixer trucks this morning along the Poriporana freeway opposite the Wayan Hotel here in Port Moresby. According to the driver, who walked away unharmed, the truck's brakes failed while he was turning left into Champion Parade. This forced him to hit the Rhode Island Triangle as he tried to regain momentum. The truck capsized onto the fence line of a property owned by the Star Mountain landowner group. MTV's Michelle Bird with more. 
At 8 a.m. this morning, a cement mixer truck belonging to the PNG Aggregate Concrete Company, loaded with wet cement, was headed down the Poreporana freeway, turning into Champion Parade opposite the Wayne Hotel, when, according to the driver, his brakes failed, causing him to crash into the fence line of a property owned by the Star Mountain Landowner Group, missing the house and tenants by a meager two meters. The truck driver walked away uninjured and was quickly taken into custody by traffic police. Luckily, there were no casualties. This is the third time a vehicle has crashed into the Star Mountain property, this being by far the worst case. Michelle Bird, National MTV News. Well, tension is building at the care centres in Madang as Manam Islanders wait anxiously for the Manam resettlement bill to be passed. The Islanders, Kukurais or leaders have called on the Madang Governor Jim Kass to make sure the bill gets passed since two children and an adult have died in the recent minor eruption and effects from the five-month-long drought. MTV's Rachel Shisei reports from Madang. The islanders are hard hit at the care centers compared to those on the island given the fact that they do gardening and gather food in the piece of land allocated to them that has to be split among them. An adult and two children have died at the Asarumba and the Portsdam care centers. These people have been anticipating their bill since Parliament resumed on Tuesday. The islanders' staple food is banana, and the bananas are dying. Banana, ashloko brook, na planty or or kakaru or doko ko dai. The Kukurais, or leaders on behalf of their people, are appealing to the government to address their needs as soon as possible since they are disadvantaged on all sides. Uh, Honorable Prime Minister Onili Totokosem uh, uh, get uh, uh, assistance or support by go through all, all districts. But then we have a local center in Olukimiet. Supply by go through all one district. But me appeal to government say please, me plan people people man have salary case interest, me plan to build a time through language now. The islanders say they are for the bill by Governor Cass because they initiated and signed on it before it was passed on to the governor. Hardships at the care centers were experienced since their establishments, but with this five going six months drought, these people's lives are at risk more than ever. Rachel Shise, National MTV News, Medang. Meanwhile, Northern Governor Gary Chufa said that the deferral to consider the Manam Resettlement Authority bill today by Parliament is an injustice to the people of the volcanic island. He was speaking after Parliament's session today, which ended around midday. I think every Madang MP, regardless of whether they're in government or opposition, they should all immediately, immediately have a meeting right now. The fundamental and strategic responsibilities of any government is to save lives. And they fail today. They fail today to do that. The Manam people have been waiting for 12 years. How can we keep postponing their matter? Especially now when the drought is just here upon us. This is horrible. This is terrible. Well, Forest Minister Douglas Tomoriesa has brushed aside claims by non-government organizations and people who claim that PNG is exporting illegal logs overseas. Tomoriesa says all logs are legally certified before leaving PNG shores. Also, National Forest Service Acting Managing Director Good Goodwill Amos told journalists in a media conference today that claims of illegal logging in the country is false. 38 million hectares of Papua New Guinea's land area is covered by forest. That equates to about 80 percent, making PNG the third country in the world to have the biggest forest cover. However, reports of illegal logging and exports of round logs have tarnished the reputation of PNG's logging industry. But in the past 10 years, improvements have been made in the industry. These improvements include a review of the new forest policies and the introduction of forest sensor device, which makes it easier for monitoring logging activities. Forest Minister Douglas Tumoriasa says at present, 
claims of illegal logging and exports of illegal logs are false. He says in the past 10 years, logging companies have strictly complied with laws and logs have been certified by forest, customs and relevant authorities before being shipped overseas. There are international standards we have to comply to. And we've complied with every standard that the international community has set for us. National Forest Service Acting Managing Director Goodwill Amos says claims of illegal logging at present times are false and those organizations and people who claim that PNG is exporting illegal logs have to substantiate their claims with facts. So all these projects that we have, all the timber projects that we have, they are legal because they have timber permits, they have timber authorities, they have timber licenses. That's why the people, they re, once they see those documents, they invite us to the area. PNG is currently hosting the third APEC meeting for ministers responsible for forestry in Port Mosby. The leaders in the APEC member countries discussed how they can mitigate deforestation, replant trees, sustainable forest management and logging among others. Minister Tumu Riasa says in the last 30 years, logging has contributed over 300 billion kina as revenue for the country. Quinten Alomp, National MTV News. Now in one of our stories yesterday about a security bulletin from company into oil raising security concerns with the chief secretary and the register of political parties, we erred in mistakenly naming oil search in one instance in that story. MTV News apologizes for this oversight and confirms that all search remains a committed development partner to the country and was in no way involved in yesterday's story. And now let's check out the finance news. The Kina closed unchanged at 0.3440 US dollars in the interbank market and at Bank South Pacific, our Kina was trading at 0.3365 US dollars, 0.4642 Australian dollars, 0.3014 euro and 40.19 Japanese yen. Taking a look at commodity prices at New York close today, gold and copper closed lower while coffee and cocoa closed the day higher. Palm oil crude oil closed lower while copper closed the day higher. And finally on the stock market the Dow Jones closed at 42 points lower, the ASX closed at 21 points lower as well and the All Ordinaries closed at 22 points higher. Well National MTV News continues after this break, stay with us. Good to have you back with the news. Well, grade 12 students in Papua New Guinea have completed 15 out of the 19 examinations for the higher school certificate. At least 10,000 students set, sat for the business studies and geology papers today. Internal invigilators at the Gerihu Secondary School in Port Moresby say the exams are on schedule and will be completed this Friday. Garo Secondary School students are sitting for their final exams this week. School principal Martin Kenneher says over 500 students at Garaho Secondary will be competing for a space at either a college or a university in the country. Compared to last year, we had 330. This year, 10 classes of grade 12. Last year, 7 classes of grade 12. So there's an increase of 3 classes, new classes uh, as part of the expansion for Garaho Secondary School. Welda Saki is one student who has completed her business studies exams today. Her interest lies in human resource management and she aims to further her studies at a tertiary institution. Um, I just want to be a, a human resource management. For Garaho Secondary School, students are taking their exams in at least four different classrooms. External invigilators say since the start of the exams last Monday, students have been completing the exams on time. The student population is not really as Mondays. Uh, Mondays and uh, yeah, Mondays paper was uh, mathematics paper one and two. I mean paper one, that's a general and advanced, in which we have the old population and we were using this assembly all year. So as other three, I think four, four classrooms. The Garrow Secondary School here in Port Moresby has the highest number of grade 12 sitting for their HSC examinations this year. 
Now their challenge is the competition that they will be having with other students across the country in securing spaces at universities and colleges. Colin Barilai, National MTV News. The St. John the Apostle Catholic Parish in Tokarara, Port Moresby, has launched a fundraising drive for their new church building. The new church building will accommodate the growing parishioners and different spiritual activities that help to foster faith. Efforts into raising funds for the construction of a new church building for St. John the Apostles, Tokara Paris, have begun. This building, built in the 70s, cannot accommodate all parishioners and different spiritual ministerial activities. The Finance Committee aims to raise 5 million kina within three years before construction begins in 2017. The Paris recently hosted a corporate dinner to begin this fundraising drive. And the Finance Committee projects that 500,000 kina will be raised this year. Bishop of Berene Rocco Statamai thanked the Paris Pastoral Council and parishioners for taking the initiative. Apart from providing a spiritual human development and moral guidance to its members. The church building will also provide a wide range of relevant social services. Fabian Hakelitz, National MTV News. The new Loringau Town Market has complied with the Food Safety Act by having a separate wing for fish and other protein. Mothers say the market has a new structure that benefits locals. This new market has been described as a model for other markets in Papua New Guinea. MTV's Fabian Akalitz reports. This new market is located in the heart of the Manus provincial capital, Loringau. It has a new structure, three wings including fish and meat, eight boutique shops, new female toilet block, renovated toilets, a realigned market fence, newly installed security lighting and landscaping. But what's more noticeable is the fish and meat market in its own building. Manus is a maritime province where you will find one of your favorite seafood, fish, octopus, squid or clamshell, mostly sold by vendors from the smaller outer islands like Haringa and Ahos. Manus is one of the resource last provinces in PNG and people depend mostly on sea for a living. The Manus Urban Council ensures the market is always clean for use. Tax offices like Makalista Song go around collecting tax and raising awareness on the importance of hygiene. Uh, because something, um, because fish am um, kai kaya, so I'm um, like keeping away of dust, uh, flies, on this little plus something. Where you miss also bring him sick lobodina, bagarabim, life bloman. The new market was funded by the Australian government at around 72 million kina with the support of the Manus Provincial Government. Fabian Hakalitz, National MTV News. Turning to Asia, the death toll from a 7.5 magnitude earthquake that struck Pakistan's northwest and Afghanistan on Monday has surpassed 300. At least a thousand are injured as emergency teams flood both Middle Eastern states to help, the U.S. included. The earthquake caused tremors in India when it struck remote areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan on Monday afternoon. Several aftershocks from the earthquake were felt in India, which borders Pakistan, causing hundreds to evacuate. I was sitting at home when the earthquake happened, and I came out of the home with children, but one of my grandsons started running. I asked him not to run, he continued, and then the wall collapsed on him, and he was wounded. Hospitals are packed in Pakistan's Chitral district, where the highest death toll has been recorded. While in bordering Afghanistan yesterday, 12 Afghan schoolgirls were tragically killed by a stampede as they fled their building after the earthquake struck. The US, the United Nations, and India have offered disaster assistance, 
but Pakistan's information minister last night said the country is well equipped to handle disaster operations and would not appeal for international help. In Afghanistan, the death toll is expected to surpass 50, with hundreds of houses destroyed. President Ashraf Ghani urged citizens to help wherever possible. I demand all Afghans, my fellow countrymen, to help each other if they are in affected areas. Also, I ask every Afghan to provide accurate information on the casualties and damages so we can start managing help for those who need it. Alana Lay, MTV World News. Well, True Guy Sports is coming up next and we'll give you all the details after this break. Stay with us. Two Kai Sports. Thanks for joining me with True Kai Sports to Judo in the Pacific. And Fijian Josateki Naulu has set his sights on next year's Rio Olympics. Currently training and competing in various circuits in Japan, Naulu acknowledges the support from his family in his quest for Rio. He was the Oceania Judo Champion in 2006 and 2012 and is currently on an International Olympic Solidarity Scholarship. Now Josateki Naulu wants to compete in next year's Olympic Games. He was part of the Fijian team contingent to the London Olympics in 2012 and was placed seventh at the Miami Grand Prix in 2013. Naulu is no stranger to international judo competition. He competed at the 2011 Pacific Games and the 2012 Oceania Judo Championships in Cairns where he placed first in both tournaments. As he sets his target on the Rio Olympics, he is grateful for the support of his family towards his goal of competing at the upcoming Olympics. The only drawback he is seeing in his quest for Rio is funding, but he is not deterred saying we make do with what we get and is determined to work around the issue. Dion Kombang, National MTV Sports. Well, PNG Rugby League International Rod Griffin last week signed up with NRL club West Tigers on a one-year deal. Griffin joins the West Tigers from the Ipswich Jets, who featured in the Jets' recent National Club Championship victory over the Newcastle Knights. Yet to make his first grade debut, the 28-year-old has represented Papua New Guinea on six occasions in his career, including three games at the 2008 Rugby League World Cup. He can play either front row or second row and recently won Ipswich Best and Fairest Award following a memorable season. Barber, he goes over the halfway. Marvin Barber pinching his back. They're not going to catch him. Marvin goes away and scores a counter-attacking try. Griffin finally gets a shot in the NRL after playing with Wynnum Manly, Northern Pride, Tweedheads and Ipswich in the Interest Super Cup. West Tigers head coach Jason Taylor said the inclusion of Rod Griffin was an important move to help merge the club's depth next season. He's had a monster in a year, Rod Griffin. Along with Griffin, many other players from Ipswich have also acquired a spot in the NRL with other clubs. Elijah Levitt, National MTV Sports. The Intoil Turagos will make their debut appearance offshore this weekend at the Singapore Sevens. A team filled with youth and exhilarating talent will be led by a mass of experience in skipper Tissa Kautu and coach Douglas Skies. While a win is what the rugby following wants, Skies is challenging the expectations as he aims to return with less results and more experience under each player's belt. MTV's Lorraine Genia caught up with the team earlier today at the Jacksons Airport prior to their departure. The team travelled to Singapore this afternoon and will be there for the next five days. The tournament kicks off on the 31st of October and while the draws are yet to be released, there are over 20 teams confirmed for the tournament. The teams that are travelling in for the competition is a couple of our Japanese teams, including their national team as well as um, France sending the national team and uh, Springboks, the, the South Africa and French national teams there. Yeah. 
as well as a couple of academy teams from New Zealand and Britain. So it's a pretty strong competition. Guys has said previously he will be focusing more on getting the combinations right for bigger and better tournaments to come over the next few months. He has opted to use this tour to upskill the fresh talent within the playing group and to also identify a strong contingent for the upcoming Wellington Sevens qualifier. I've only got three regulars in the team, so I want to give the younger fellows a bit of a look in for the national team. So it was very um, good for Inter Royal to back us. It's a first of its kind of having a development pathway for the national sevens team with the Inter Royal Turagos, so it's good. One of the newest inclusions to the side is PAU student Coruscant Veni. Originally of Samoan heritage, the utility forward is looking forward to the opportunity of playing alongside the seniors. In fact, I've never played before on um, in the international level and I'm so grateful that I've been part of the team. And, um, you know, uh, as an upcoming player, I'm very uh, much excited to play amongst uh, some of the, you know, um, the good old players and, you know, experienced players like uh, Butler, um, Tisa and some of the boys, so um, yeah. Akar Seta is one out of the handful of talent picked straight out of the NPC Sevens for the Singapore Sevens Tour. The Rain Genia National MTV Sports. All the, all the best to the boys in the Turagu PNG Sevens team. Well, True Guy Sports continues after this break. Stay with us for more action. True Guy Sports. It's good to have you back with Trukai Sports. Barramundi star Asad Valad joined Ratu Maha in steering the BSP Heart to a comprehensive 68 runs over the Paradise Pistons in day three of the Gabba Champions Shield. Vala top scored with 92 runs from 53 balls. In the second match, Dragons took on ANZ Avalanche. MTV's Jeremy Moggy with this report. On day one of competition, the ANZ Avalanche had trashed the BSP Heart to open their championship campaign, while the Dragons had to overcome a Paradise Food Pistons in a closer encounter. The Avalanche ended the first innings racking up 153 runs after they allotted 20 overs. Barramundi star Jack Vara top scoring with 54 runs. In reply, the Dragons openers in Vani Vagivali and Chris Amini lasted for only two overs. Their partnership only able to rack up nine runs between them as the Avalanche piled on the field in pressure. The Gabachil Championships consists of players taken from the Baramandis and Garamuts as well as the Port Moresby, Lei, Ahioma and Popondera Cricket Associations. All the teams will be playing six rounds of 2020 matches, 50 overs and one day throughout the season. Jeremy Mogi national MTV Sports. The Junior Golf Development Program is beefing up its activities by appointing an internationally recognized coach to oversee the development of young golfers. The AAA rated PGA professional is expected to provide structure and direction for the junior program. PNG Golf has a vision and that vision is for golf to be the spot of choice for life of all Papua New Guineans. It has also a mission that to transform golf in PNG into an industry for the benefit of present and future generations. The appointment of new coach is to set improved standards in Papua New Guinea and hopefully put the country on the world map in future. Upcoming junior golfer, female champion, 13-year-old Natalie Mock is one of the examples of this great program. Basically about getting young juniors and developing them or getting the basics right for like starting to start golf, begin golf. Like it, it helps me in the basics so I get it right to hit the ball properly. More than 40 children enroll every year to be part of this golf development program. Their goal is to attract and retain junior golfers from throughout PNG and to build a sustainable golf industry for talented people with the ultimate aim to provide long-term employment in the sport of golf. 15-year-old Vagi James, top junior male champion, is part of this program and plays a vital role to the young golfers. Senior juniors in this program. We have to come take part every time and some small kids are coming out and they know that uh, we are the 
senior juniors they need to get some lessons out of us and be role models yes like me i've been take part when i'm small as part of this program talented young golfers are identified and are given opportunity to progress from amateur to professional level to ensure the high competitive environment is maintained mike Oime, national mtv sports well, Mike Coimer's report wraps up True Guy Sports tonight. Coming up next, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Stay with us. True Guy Sports. True Guy Sports. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. In southern region, Port Moresby and Karama, dry weather, although low clouds expected, and mostly fine expected in Alatau, Popondeta and Taru. In Momase, mostly fine expected throughout all centres. In the New Guinea Islands, mostly fine expected in Morangao and Kaviang. However, Kokopo, Rabal, Kimbe and Buka to anticipate brief thundery showers. And in the islands, all centres to look forward to dry weather, although low clouds expected. And now let's take a look at forecasts for small ships, but first there is a strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait, Daru to Kiwai Island to Karama, Yule Island through to Hood Point to Samurai Island Cape Vogel, Finchafen to Fitia Strait, CSC Islands included, to Long Island and West New Britain. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait, Tadaru to, to Kiwai Island, Kerama to Yule Island, Hood Point with waters of eastern and western Milan Bay Islands, seas of 2.5 metres to 3 metres, waters of Hood Point through to Samurai Island to Cape Vogel, to Finchafen and waters of western New Britain, seas of 2 metres to 2.5 metres, waters of Finchafen through Fitia Strait, CSC Island to Long Island, seas of 2 metres to 3 metres, waters of west Long Island to Medang to Bogia, through to Wewag, Aitape, Fanimore and the northern PNG Indonesian border, including waters of Manus and its western group of islands, seas of 0.5 metres to 1.5 metres, and lastly, waters of New Island to East New Britain and Bougainville, seas of 0.5 metres to 1.3 metres. And now, ocean forecasts for PNG areas, Coral Sea, seas rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots, Solomon Sea and Bismarck Sea, sea slight to rather rough with southeast winds at 15 to 25 knots, and Pacific Ocean Sea slight with northwest to northeast winds at 10 to 15 knots. Now let's recap our top stories for tonight before we go. Opposition files motion for votes of no confidence. Also, tension bills as Manam Resettlement Bill is tabled in Parliament. And another nasty accident along the freeway. And that's the way it is this Wednesday, the 28th of October 2015. From all of us here, I'm Tokana Asavi Jr. You take care and stay happy. Good night.